Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 586th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you probably already heard me talk about the Edible Backyard Summit. It's a three-day online food-growing inspiration and education event. Thousands joined us for our summits in 2020, and we're at it again. If you enjoy the Urban Farm podcast, then I can pretty much guarantee you that you're going to love the Edible Backyard Summit. It's just like the podcast in that it's free, and you'll learn a lot from experts in their fields. And unlike the podcast, you get to see the presenters and have your questions answered live. Plus, there's usually some fun conversation happening in the chat box for those who want to join in. The upcoming Edible Backyard Summit airs live March 23rd through the 25th with informative presentations that food growers of all kinds will enjoy. Whether you are an inspiring newbie or a seasoned expert, and whether you live in an apartment or have acres to grow on. You'll learn principles to follow when you plan and place your garden, regenerative composting techniques, patio farming for small spaces, hacks for year-round gardening, and lots more. To sign up for free, head over to ediblebackyardsummit.com. And if you have friends and family that love to garden, please invite them too. This is a great opportunity to do something fun virtually with other food growers in your life. If you're ready for some spring gardening inspiration for your most vibrant, healthy, and self-reliant life, I invite you to join me for the Edible Backyard Summit. Sign up at ediblebackyardsummit.com and get ready to create the edible yard of your dreams. Today on our podcast, we have someone who protects her gardens from cold weather and pests and extends her gardening season. We're talking with Nikki Jabour about growing undercover. Nikki is the author of four books on food gardening, including The Year-Round Vegetable Gardener and Growing Undercover. She's also a two-time winner of the prestigious American Horticulture Society Book Award. Congratulations, Nikki. She also writes for newspapers and magazines and has hosted a weekly radio show for the past 14 years. Growing Undercover, her latest book focuses on techniques for more productive, weather-resistant, pest-free vegetable gardens. Nikki gardens in Zone 5B in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Has about 20 raised beds, assorted cold frames, a polytunnel in her garden. She harvests year-round without adding heat by using garden covers like row covers, shade cloth, mini hoop tunnels, cold frames, and deep mulching. Her techniques not only allow her to enjoy a year-round harvest, but they reduce pests. They also create a microclimate around her plants, which allows growing heat-loving veggies in a short-season climate. Welcome to the show today, Nikki. Are you ready to rock? I am so happy to be here. Yes, let's do it. Awesome. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? Yeah, thanks, Greg. Well, I got to say, I mean, it, like I think most gardeners, <laughs> it wasn't the straightest path. You know, I started off uh, with a family that every year planted a summer vegetable garden. Oh, nice. And here on the Northeast, it was a vegetable garden that was basically May to maybe early September between those frost dates. And it wasn't that productive, honestly. I hope my mother's not listening. But it was, <laughs> it, it was enough to show me that food tastes better when you grow it yourself. So we harvested potatoes and carrots and beans, and they were so delicious. And it kind of sparked my interest in gardening when I was a kid. By the time I was a teenager, I had taken over that space, made it my own, and was growing lots of different kinds of herbs and vegetables. And eventually, I studied horticulture, graduating from one of our local universities here on the East Coast. And I worked for a seed company. And it wow. just, I happened. Wow. I, it was kind of accidental, really. I happened to get into garden writing for a local newspaper who wanted a column. And, you know, from there, I jumped to magazines, to books, to radio, to all the other crazy things I do today. <laughs> wow, nice. So you actually started gardening as a teenager. 
I mean, I, I started probably when I was eight or nine, but I, I got into it seriously. Like, I knew it was going to be a lifelong passion for me by the time I was about 13 or 14. And I got to say, it's funny, you know, in my dorm room in university, I didn't have a roommate. So the extra bed, I set up grow lights and I was growing microgreens and other vegetables there. Oh my gosh, really? <laughs> Yeah, I was probably the only university student growing legitimate herbs in their dorm room. <laughs> there you go. Wow. Well, I planted my first garden when I was 14. We moved into the Weldon house, as I call it, and mom said, see the right half of the backyard? That's your garden. Go start <sighs> digging. And I was just Amazing. off to the races as a teenager. So. And what kind of climate was that when you started? Oh, well, I'm in the low desert here near uh, in Phoenix, 100 plus degree temperatures in the summertime and nearly never does it freeze. Wow. Amazing. So. <laughs> I'm very jealous, particularly right now in winter. <laughs> yeah. So your book and you, you wrote a book growing undercover and it's, it's about extending seasons, but it's not all about that. Tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, my first book, The Around Vegetable Gardener, really focused on my winter gardening techniques. So that came out almost 10 years ago, which makes me feel super old. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to write a new book that kind of basically talks about all the stuff that I've done the past decade for season extension, but also all the other benefits of using garden covers, you know, for, pre for preventing pests like cabbage worms and flea beetles and, oh my gosh, I deal with deer, rabbits, and groundhogs. And using garden covers has wow. been a game changer for me, you know? And in a, in a short season climate, you know, growing up, I couldn't really mature hot peppers. And, you know, using garden covers like a mini hoop tunnel or a poly tunnel, it really allows me to create a microclimate around those heat-loving plants that maybe don't thrive in my zone, and I still get a great harvest from them. So there's many benefits to, you know, using garden covers, and I like to think of them as garden insurance because they just make sure that I get to enjoy a crop from the plants that I'm, well, that I'm planting in spring. Right. Say more about garden insurance, would you? Yeah. Well, I, like, I think of them as garden insurance because, you know, oftentimes cabbage worms are just, it, it's everywhere in the summer. You see the moths flying around. And if I'm using an insect barrier cover or a lightweight roll cover over my broccoli and cabbages and kales and other cabbage family plants, then I'm not going to have a problem with cabbage worms and I'm getting a maximum harvest. So using these garden covers, especially for new food gardeners, I think is an easy way to make sure that you get to enjoy the crop that you planted, as well as protect from the larger pests like deer and groundhogs and rabbits, or even birds. Oftentimes I will plant lettuce seedling seeds or pea seeds or bean seeds, and the, the crows, the birds will be up there oh, digging yeah. up those seeds to eat. So if I lay a row cover over top of the bed, you know, I know they're going to grow for me because they're protected from those pests. Wow. So you call them row covers. I call them old bed sheets. <laughs> well, you can use old bed sheets as well. And let me tell you, I have, but I do buy row covers intended for garden protection now just because they let more light through than an old bed sheet mm, would. Right. One of my techniques for bringing up seeds, because of the birds, the birds will right. ravage your garden as, you know, you put down your garden bed, add your seeds, and then I drop an old bed sheet over it for two weeks until they, you know, until they start popping up. And that, that gets a lot of the work done there. Yeah. Oh, totally. And that's such a good way to do it because you're creating a little microclimate, uh, holding soil moisture, preventing the sun from drying the soil, and just creating an ideal growing environment for those seeds to germinate. So yeah. smart. Yeah. So let's talk about different types of garden covers. We mentioned in the intro multiple ones. What's the difference and why would I use each one? Yeah. And I mean, I talk about the fact that you don't need every type of garden cover. So when you're thinking about what maybe tools you need in your little garden toolkit, I would think about what your goals are. Like, are you mainly trying to prevent pests, cucumber beetles, you know, uh, slugs, again, the flea beetles, the cabbage worms, or are you trying to protect from frost? Are you trying to mature crops that maybe don't normally mature in, in a short season garden or a northern garden, like large fruited tomatoes or eggplants or peppers? So think about your goals, and then we can kind of bring in the covers. You've got everything from super simple covers like row covers, you know, and they come in lightweight, medium weight, heavy weight. But I think a lightweight row cover is sort of essential in a vegetable garden because it can be used for pest prevention from insect pests. It can be used for deer prevention from deer munching on your crops, or it can be used for a light frost. So that's a very versatile cover. So I think every food gardener should have at least one piece of lightweight row cover on hand. So that would be sort of the starter in terms of garden covers, I would say, Greg. And that one, you can actually see through it, right? True. Yeah, it's 
pretty lightweight. It offers about two degrees of frost protection and allows about 85 to 90 percent of the light to pass through. So if you're putting it over top something like a potato plant, you know, because you didn't want potato beetles eating all of your little potato plants, then you could actually leave that cover in place until it's time to harvest. The whole season long, you could float it on hoops over top your potato bed. You know, but if you were growing something like cucumbers or squash and protecting them from squash bugs or cucumber beetles, you would have to remove that cover once the plants begin to flower, of course, because they need to be pollinated. So crops that don't need to be pollinated, potatoes, cabbage, broccoli, you can leave it on until it's time to harvest. For crops that do need to be pollinated, like cucumbers or melons or squash, you'll have to take it off once they begin to flower. And for the larger pests, how does it keep deer away? Well, deer actually, although they're tenacious in my garden, they are pretty much foiled by a simple barrier. So, you know, floating a row cover on hoops over top of garden bed, the deer can't reach the vegetables. Therefore, they're going to go somewhere else, probably to my neighbors. <laughs> and I'm sorry to my neighbors. But you don't have to use necessarily a row cover for deer. There's other materials you can use as well to pre- prevent deer from munching on your vegetables. You could use deer netting or bird netting, and you could float that over top of hoops. Uh, you could use chicken wire. You can use things like this. You know, they, they have larger holes, of course, than, say, row cover, you know, which prevents little pests. But for bigger pests like deer, you can use something like chicken wire because the deer still can't get through the chicken wire to eat your beans and your peas and your other vegetables. Wow. So that's the covers. What about a polytunnel? What is that? Oh, that's a game changer. <laughs> that's, a, that's what we call that. I've had many types of structures in my garden over the years from, you know, simple things like cold frames. And I make mini hoop tunnels with covered with, well, row cover or clear poly to, you know, a, a bigger, larger poly tunnel, which is what I currently have. And, you know, it's 14 feet wide by 24 feet long. Wow. And it is just an incredible structure. Um, you know, like most gardeners, I would have loved a Victorian style glass greenhouse, but I didn't have the $140,000 to pay for it. So instead right. I went with a poly tunnel. I paid a little bit extra for the front to be hard polycarbonate, which is just a little more ornamental in my urban setting. But that structure allows me to harvest all winter long. I even overwinter crops that normally would not overwinter in Halifax, Nova Scotia, like artichokes overwinter in there for me. Deep, I mulch them with straw, but they overwinter. And then I even have a little patio in the very back of my structure, nice. six feet by seven feet with a pretty blue bench because it's a space where I want to sit and enjoy. In summertime, when it is a jungle of tomatoes and cucumbers, I want to sit in there and just love that space. I write from in there. You know, I drink tea in there. I read my books in there. It's, a, it's an awesome space to be, so I wanted to make sure I had a seating area so I could kind of, well, almost live in there, honestly, Greg. <laughs> wow, sounds like an wow. epic office. Yeah, you know what? It is amazing. And I could be out there today. It's just above freezing in the polytunnel, although it's well below freezing outside the polytunnel. But yeah, I didn't think I wanted to risk it. <laughs> and what is the cover on top of the polytunnel? Is it just a uh, UV protected plastic or? Yeah, exactly. It's a four year greenhouse UV protected poly. And, you know, I often buy those by the roll. And then I use a roll for so many different ways in the garden. And it's, a, it's the cheapest way to buy it. So it lasts usually about five to six years for me with gentle use. I'll use it on my poly tunnel. As well, I'll use it on my little mini hoop tunnels, the little mini greenhouses I create in the garden. They take about five minutes to set up using PVC hoops or little metal hoops or wire hoops. And then I'll cover it with the clear plastic and use that to also, you know, create little microclimates for my just planted tomatoes in spring to protect from frost. Or even in the other end of the season in fall and early winter, I use them to cover things like broccoli and cabbage and arugula and other salad greens so we can harvest for, you know, eight to 12 weeks longer than normal. What is your growing season look like? Well, the growing season is relatively short. It's about 160 days long between the frost-free dates. But, you know, there's not a day of the year I can't go up to my garden and pick at least 20 different kinds of vegetables. <laughs> you know, in winter time, it's things like different winter lettuces, spinach, arugula, scallions, kale, endive, lots of Asian greens, of course, as well. And then root crops and stem crops like leeks and carrots and beets and parsnips. So generally our last frost is around late May but it can be in June sometimes. And then our first frost in fall is usually late September, sometimes early October. 
although, again, it's also been an early September, an unexpected year. So these garden covers, as I say, they're garden insurance, so that all of a sudden, September 10th, we get a frost warning. I know I can cover a lot of my vegetables and protect them from that early frost so that they can continue to mature and feed us for weeks more. Wow. And for somebody that's just getting started that lo- that needs some kind of new you know, cover for their garden, where's the best place to start? Yeah, I, I think, again, that row cover is probably a simple place to start because you can use that row cover and lay it directly on top of vegetables, or you can float it on hoops made of wires or PVC. I use half-inch PVC conduit, which you can buy from any uh, home improvement warehouse for just a couple bucks. And, it, you know, I use three of them in my beds, and most of my beds are four feet by eight feet or four feet by ten feet, and it's the perfect size mini greenhouse. So, you know, doing that really lets you protect from frost, from, you know, inclement weather like hail or really heavy downpours which can dislodge young plants mm. and seedlings or wash away seeds if you've just planted them. You know, uh, sometimes we get snow in October here, and if I've got a, a nice little mini hoop tunnel in my garden, it's going to protect from that as well. But if someone is, like, totally new to it and they're thinking, I- I'd like to extend my season maybe in fall a bit, we'll start by deep mulching. If you have any root crops left in your garden in October, November, things like carrots and parsnips and beets, you can deep mulch them with a foot or so of straw or shredded leaves and then harvest them all winter long. So that's like a free, easy way to get started using garden covers. And that's actually storing the vegetables in the ground until you're ready to eat them. Yeah, I mean, I know certain gardeners like to dig them up and store them in damp sand. That sounds like a lot of work to me. I would rather leave them in place in the garden. And then you get the double benefit of the fact that the colder temperatures convert some of the starches in those roots to sugars, and they taste better. Oh. The carrots that I dig like now from February in my garden are the sweetest carrots you'll ever eat because they're just packed full of sugar, so they're so delicious. My kids have called them candy carrots because they're so good when you harvest them in the cold season. Wow. One of the things, so Scott Murray is a longtime friend of mine. He's been on the podcast many times. He's an organic farmer in San Diego County. He coached me the other day. We had some carrots growing in the yard, and I said, I said to him, how do we keep them from going limp when you put them in the refrigerator. Do you have a solution for that? Well, honestly, if I was I generally harvest them when I want them. <laughs> so that's kind of my solution. Ah, Having perfect. I- there's really not a day of the year I don't have carrots in my garden. Sometimes if I, you know, get a little greedy over the winter and eat too many, I don't have very many left in April, but I generally always have carrots. And if I harvest carrots and I don't want them to go limp, like homegrown carrots, I, I will cut the tops off and I will wrap them in damp paper towel, and then I'll put them in my fridge, like wrapped in a plastic uh, baggie or something, right. and that'll help keep them crisp. Or you can, of course, you know, store them in actual cold water in a container in your fridge. But yeah, generally, I when I want them, I run up and I grab them and then I come back in the kitchen and I chop them up or I, I cook them right away. There you go. That's the one of the big differences because carrots will grow all year around. So, yeah. you know, they get pithy if we leave them in the ground too long here in the low desert. Yeah, and I mean, even even here as well, like the, the carrots I grow in spring, I'm not going to keep those in the garden all summer mm. and fall and try to harvest them into winter. I'm planting my winter carrots in late July, uh, and that way they'll be at the perfect size and maturity level, and like you say, not too pithy and woody by the time I have to deep mulch them for winter harvesting. Yeah, and that was Scott's solution. He, he said harvest them and stick them in a jar of water in the refrigerator. Yeah. Yeah, and they should last about a, at least a week, if not longer that way, yeah. especially if you change the water every day or two. Cool. So if I was walking up your driveway, can you share with me a word picture of what I'm going to see in your garden and farm? Are you in an urban area? Tell me a little bit about your space. Yeah, I mean, I'm in a city, but I'm in the suburbs, and so I have close to an acre, actually. It's oh. a long, narrow lot. So if you're coming up my very steep driveway, by the time you got to the top of the driveway uh, where the house is, you would see my polytunnel. You probably wouldn't so much see the garden because it's pretty hidden from view. I have it tucked in the very backyard, which is the flat piece of land of my property. It's an ever so slight south-facing slope, and so it's maximum sunlight, and it's pretty mostly flat. So you go up there, and all of a sudden you see the 20 raised beds. And they're, you know, they're arranged in a nice symmetrical formation. 
but I also have freeform beds along the side made of straw bales, made of just piles of compost and straw mixed together. Again, there's a polytunnel there. There's some pollinator and herb gardens as well, cold frames. So there's quite a mixture. But, you know, because I want my vegetable garden to be beautiful as well as productive um, year-round, you walk into the garden, you're going to see lots of flowers, especially in spring, summer, and fall lots of flowers to attract the beneficial insects, and the pollinators. And I have a lot of vertical structures too, like tunnels, which get covered in, you know, smothered really in pole beans and cucumbers and melons and and little pumpkins and squash. So I try to make the space beautiful and productive so that we can harvest from there all year round. (laughs) Nice. You mentioned south facing. Can you share why that's important? Yeah, I mean, that's going to offer you maximum light. You want a vegetable garden to have at least eight hours of full sun every day. And so the fact that my garden, you know, is ever so slightly sloped towards the south, you know, offers maximum sunlight in the sky. And, you know, it's very important even for cold frames, for example. All my cold frames also, they have a slope on the top about a 30, 35 degree angle that also faces towards the south. So even in the winter when the sun is very low in the sky up here in the north, I'm still getting sunlight entering those structures uh, to create the microclimate around those crops so I can still harvest them. Oh, nice. You shared something with me before we started recording. You said that Nova Scotia is all organic. Tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty proud of our province. I mean, this is something that started in our Canadian province of Quebec years ago in terms of landscape use of chemicals. You know, people using weed and feed on their lawns, for example. And honestly, it's probably been about, I guess, 10 or 15 years now. I should know, but I don't even remember it's been so long. But you can't buy weed and feed here in in the stores because it's not sold. I mean, you can apply some pesticides if you need to for a certain, but you, for like a certain issue, but you have to apply for the uh, permission to do so. You can't just go and buy chemicals for, you know, aphids and dump it in your, ve- your vegetable garden. You're not allowed to do that. And I think at first people were very worried about dandelions taking over the entire <laughs> province. Yeah. And that didn't happen. <laughs> it just didn't happen. But you know what? I have so many more bees in my garden now, which mm. is just incredible. And not just like the same species. I see a diversity of species of bees and pollinators and beneficial insects that I didn't see 20 plus years ago. So I really think that made an impact on, you know, the, the populations of these bugs in our, in our province. Wow. That actually gave me chills when you shared that with me earlier. That was like... Uh. Yeah, I mean, it's the way we should all be growing. You right? know, like, uh, I, I mean, I don't care. Our, our parks, if you walk in our parks, you might see a couple dandelions in the lawn. Our attitude is so. <laughs> it's feeding the bees. And then if people want to forage them, they know they're not going to be doused in chemicals. So go crazy. <laughs> yeah, we should be so smart down here in the States. Yeah, I, I think it's coming. I think people are realizing, you know, what these chemicals are doing to our natural spaces and how they leach out into groundwater and, and natural, you know, uh, streams and rivers and, and lakes and stuff and, and how unnecessary they are. Yeah. Do you preserve any of this stuff that you grow or do you just hold it in the ground and eat it when you need it? <laughs> eat it when you need it. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I do some preserving, but not a whole lot. I mean, my garden where I have 20 raised beds and such, and because of the work that I do, I'm always experimenting and growing new things. So I don't usually end up with a giant glut of any one type of crop because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I have 20 raised beds, but there might be 50 different types of vegetables and varieties growing at any one time. Plus, I have a lot of family who seem to think the garden is their grocery store. So uh, <laughs> they nice. tend nice. to get eaten, but I do make pickles and, you know, I make lots of jams from the fruits that we grow and things like that. So I I make the essentials that we love, but I don't have to put up a whole bunch of things or fill my freezer because generally we eat seasonally and it's all up in the garden. Wow. How cool is that? Tell me about SavvyGardening.com. Well, that is something that I started with two other professional garden writers, horticulturists, Jessica Walliser, as well as Tara Noland, who's Canadian. Jessica's from Pittsburgh, and Tara's a fellow Canadian from outside Toronto. And we started that because we just wanted to share good information based on science and our experience with gardeners. And it has taken off. We get about one to two million visitors a month on SavvyGardening.com. Wow. And, you know... 
Yeah, I write mainly about the food gardening. Jessica writes well, about food gardening, but also mainly about pollinators and beneficial insects and companion planting, science-based companion planting. Mm-hmm. And Tara writes about ornamentals and perennials and container gardening. So we all match up really well together, and it's been a lot of fun, and it's, it's so great to be able to share that kind of content with gardeners. Yeah, wow. And we've had Jessica on the show uh, in the past, and she's going to be on real soon again as well. So, maybe... yeah, I, I did listen. I love that episode. She's the one who tipped me off, and I was like, "Wow!" Like, uh, yeah, <laughs> I told you, I've been downloading far too many podcasts now onto <laughs> my phone, and it's a little full. But it's my when I need a break from my work day. This is what I'm tuning into, and I'm loving it and learning so much. Well, thanks. Maybe we need to get Tara on here as well. Oh, she's fantastic. She's a raised bed expert, actually, uh, as well as a front yard garden expert. <laughs> oh, cool. What does your garden in Canada have in common with the Mediterranean region? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Well, actually, my husband is from originally from a small village in the mountains uh, outside Beirut in Lebanon. And years ago, I wanted to grow more v- vegetables that maybe he and his parents would have been familiar with. You know, because I know Nova Scotia doesn't necessarily have the same climate as Lebanon, but I thought there's got to be some vegetables that they would have eaten there that I could grow here. And I kind of got, you know, fell down this little rabbit hole of, <laughs> you know, looking for Lebanese and Middle Eastern vegetables. And right? did I ever, right. yeah, I discovered so many. It was incredible. And this became actually inspired my third book, Veggie Garden Remix, which is all about trying unusual and global and heirloom vegetables. So yeah, I grow za'atar. I grow Lebanese cucumber melons and, and Lebanese tomatoes and just so many different vegetables that you would enjoy there in, here in my Nova Scotia garden. And it was just so much fun to provide food for, especially for his parents, you know, even chickpeas that they were familiar with, but they just didn't have access to in Nova Scotia. Mm-hmm. And cucumelons, isn't that what you call them? Well, I have cucumelons and I love my cucumelons, but I also grow cucumber melons which a lot of people would call Armenian cucumbers. Uh In Lebanon, you would call them emekti. And they're botanically a muskmelon, but they look and taste like a cucumber. But they are the best-tasting cucumber you will ever eat. So I've been collecting varieties of these cucumber melons to grow in my garden. And I cannot grow enough. And let me tell you, I grow a lot, but still, the whole family wants more. So I'm going to have to dig up a new garden this year just to grow more cucumber melons. (laughs) Nice. And where do you find seeds for all of these? Yeah, well, surprisingly, like Armenian cucumbers, most seed companies carry seed for them. But a lot of immigrants have given me seeds, pinches of seeds from their home countries, because these are also grown in Italy and Syria and different parts of the Middle East. So, you know, oftentimes people send me seeds and give me seeds, and so I grow them. And originally, I didn't know there was more than one variety of this type of muskmelon, but I, I, so far I've, I've gathered dozens. And, it, I, of course, I saved the seeds again myself. I've shared them with local, you know, heirloom seed companies here on the East Coast, and now they're starting to sell them, which is fantastic, so that everybody can be growing these varieties. Wow. The importance of heirloom vegetables, finding the seeds, and growing them out. There, There's the story right there. Good job, Nikki. Totally. Yeah, it's amazing, honestly. And uh, we have so many in the U.S. and Canada, amazing heirloom seed companies doing incredible work preserving these varieties and making them widely available to all of us. It's fantastic. <laughs> wow. So I'm going to shift on you, and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure, and what you might have learned from it. I, I think, you know, especially when I delved into all the global types of vegetables, that there was a learning curve for me because, you know, I was really pushing some of the things I could grow here in Nova Scotia, and garden covers did certainly help me achieve more success. But, you know, early on when I first started planting those cucumber melons I talked about, I didn't get one, not one, and I planted like 12 vines, and I was like, what am I doing wrong? They're flowering by early summer, so I should be getting lots of them. And I realized I didn't necessarily have the pollinators to pollinate that particular vegetable because they weren't indigenous to my region. So I actually started hand pollinating. And I do this for my edible gourds too, like loofah gourds, bottle gourds. I get out and hand pollinate, and that just made all the difference. And once I discovered that hand pollinating would result in fruits, you know, I go out there every couple days in the summer, I hand pollinate what needs to be hand pollinated, and I get a bumper crop of all of these vegetables now. Wow, that is quite the lesson. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, just because you don't necessarily succeed the first time, I wouldn't necessarily give up. If you're a new food gardener, and my gosh, we have so many new food gardeners, don't give up. Do a little more research, ask questions from other gardeners, and try again. Don't give up. 
Amen to that. What do you consider your biggest success? I think the fact that I live in Nova Scotia and I harvest year-round. Uh, I'm pretty proud of that fact because, again, I grew up with a garden that was planted the long weekend in May, you know, harvest it pretty much by early September. And I, I honestly thought that was the whole gardening season in my province, in my region. And it's not. And I've discovered that so many other people have been extending their seasons. And I read and I learned from them and I experimented. And the fact that I can go up to my garden any day of the year and harvest with no heat, no heated structures, I think that is my, my biggest success and what I'm most proud of. Wow. That is amazing, especially someplace that it gets so cold. Yeah, I was up to, when we had the snow, 18 inches of snow on Monday, I walked up to the garden and I was like, should I harvest in the cold frame today? I don't know if I want to dig it out, but I did. <laughs> and what drives you? I, like a lot of gardeners, I love feeding my family. You know, I get so much satisfaction growing these vegetables and varieties, um, even if most of them don't help me <laughs> in the garden. It's so much fun. So the fact that I can always try new varieties and always try new crops and keep pushing myself and pushing the boundaries of what I'm growing, like the artichokes here in my northern zone, I think that keeps driving me to keep going and trying new things, you know, and, and while my family maybe doesn't necessarily want to be up in the garden, you know, digging compost and manure, they certainly love going through the seed catalogs with me and picking out fun things to grow. So I love that. I love bringing in my nieces and nephews and my kids and everybody trying to decide what they want to eat this year. I think it's really fun. And I'm really happy that most of my family now understands where food comes from and what it takes to grow it. And I think that gives them a greater appreciation uh, for our local farm producers as well when you go to places like the farmer's markets. Yeah. I, I have said for years the most important thing we can be doing right now is figuring out where our food comes from and how to grow our own. Right, yeah. And I think, I mean, obviously 2020 was the year we all did that, but that is continuing into 2021 and I think beyond. We've got a whole new crop of gardeners that I hope are going to embrace it and love it as much as we do. Wow. And... What is the most fun thing that you've grown in the past year for you? Oh, my God. The past year. Well, the past year has been a strange year with the pandemic. Right? I, I kind of shifted a bit to more, what can I produce that's going to give me a lot of food and a reliable harvest? <sighs> I would say, you know, I love ground cherries. So I love growing fun things. Like our ground cherry crop is so much fun to grow. So that was really uh, awesome. I grew some really interesting different types of tomatillos last summer, which were really weird. And they grew great in my northern climate, which was fantastic. And, of course, our cucamelons, which everybody in my household loves, we grow those as well. The blue pumpkins I grew last summer were so much fun, so productive, and delicious. So even though there was a pandemic and I tried to grow mainly staple crops, I still managed to squeak in a few little fun things, too. Wow. And you love what you do. I can tell it in your voice. Totally. I mean, how lucky am I? <laughs> my office is either my polytunnel or my garden. You know, oftentimes my job for the day is just to go up and harvest food. I mean, it's fantastic. Uh, you know, I get to order from seed catalogs. I get to, to talk to other gardeners. I get to learn from them. You know, I usually get, usually used to give talks around North America. That's not, it's all switched to Zoom now, but I get to, you know, learn from so many different people and hear what they like to grow and even techniques and how they do it so I can maybe apply some of those to my own garden. So, yeah, yeah it, this is a fantastic industry and I'm so proud to be a part of it. Wow. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Love it. If you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be and why? The book I'm reading now, even though I've already read it once, but the book I'm rereading again now is the book by Jessica Walliser, you know, Plant Partners, which is all about science-based companion planting. This book is so long overdue, which is why I'm loving it so much. So much of our companion planting suggestions have been based on, you know, garden lore and not science and facts. So, you know, she spent a lot of time, like two years, scouring all of the research papers and talking to experts and such and gathering all this science-based information to show how and why we should pair plants. So it's, I mean, reading her book years ago, Attracting Beneficial Bugs to Your Garden, changed the way I use flowers and herbs in my food garden mm -hmm. and help, you know, reduce the pest problems I have and increase the, po the pollinators. So this book I was really excited about, Plant Partners, and I've been, um, I've been making notes of how I'm going to put it to work in my own garden this year. So that would be the book I would recommend. Wow, nice. And what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Gosh, well, if they're new gardeners or thinking of, you know, starting their garden for the first time, I would say start small. <laughs> you know, maybe one small plot, you know, even a raised bed, a four foot by eight foot raised bed. It's more than enough space to kind of get started in food gardening and, you know, and grow a couple things what you like to eat. But for everybody else, I would say, 
always try something new every year, at least one or two either new crops or varieties. You know, variety is the spice of life. And I think a lot of times we get, we get kind of in a rut growing the same different, the same varieties, the same vegetables every single year. And there is so much diversity now available in our seed catalog. So take advantage and try a couple new things this year. You won't regret it. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Nikki. Oh, thank you. This has been a treat. <laughs> this place is a highlight of my week. So thank you so much for including me. Oh, you bet. How can our listeners get a hold of you? Well, of course, uh, as we mentioned, I'm on SavvyGardening.com. So that's the website I own. And also on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. You can find me at Nikki Jabor. And, you know, as well, I have some videos on YouTube. And, uh, yeah, that's the best way to find me, social media, I would say. Nikki Jabor is my handle. Excellent. You can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash Savvy Gardening. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.